Hi, everybody. Dleka here. You probably know me as the executive producer on this show, but I wanted to tell you something really cool. Last summer, we launched podcastingseriously.com. It's our very own online learning platform all about podcasting. So if you're curious, if you're already in podcasting, if you want to level up in podcasting, I invite you to come to one of our monthly seminars with some of the best folks in the business. They're on Saturday. They're about an hour and a half. They're really, really fun. And you always walk away knowing so much more and with a deeper understanding of one or two or four or five different aspects of podcasting. We also have early bird pricing if you buy the whole package. So definitely encourage you to take advantage of that. So go to podcastingseriously.com. I would spell it, but that's really, really long. Podcasting plus seriously plus dot com. You got this. Hopefully I'll see you at the next session. Bye. Seventy million adults in the United States have a criminal record. In Season 3, we'll explore how our rapidly changing reality is impacting those in custody and the policies that keep them there. I'm Mitzi Miller. In Alaska, the rate of violent crime is three times higher than the national average. Last year, the U.S. federal government declared a law enforcement emergency in Alaska's rural native villages. The state's soaring crime rate, high levels of violence, and substance abuse in rural communities is not only filling prisons to capacity, it's mentally and emotionally exhausting for residents in those communities. I've lived through many tragedies in my own lifetime. Last year, U.S. Attorney General William Barr visited Alaska. During a roundtable discussion with tribal leaders from across the state, Julie Roberts Hyslop was very honest about life in her village, Tanana. Roughly 250 people live there, along the banks of the Yukon River in Alaska's interior region. On January 13, 1995, my sister-in-law was brutally murdered by her boyfriend. He was um, addicted to cocaine and alcohol, and um, he murdered her, her right in front of his son and their friend. And that was probably one of the most horrible times that I've had to live through with my husband. And then on May 1, 2014, my nephew murdered two Alaska state troopers in my mother's house. Those are things, you know, that are horrible, you know, to have to live through. Those are the things that, you know, goes on in our villages. It just happens all the time, things like that. You know, and it's not easy coming here and telling my story like that, but that's reality. The 2014 shootings Julie told the AG Barr about made headlines in Alaska for days. Thousands of people came out for a memorial to the fallen officers. Two years later, a 22-year-old man was sentenced to 203 years in prison for the shootings. His father was also sentenced for evidence tampering, with eligibility for parole. The Tanana Tribal Council says neither man can return home. Extreme violence and the fear it creates is why some local leaders have resorted to issuing what's been known commonly for years in Alaska as a blue ticket, a legal expulsion with no invitation back. Reporter Emily Schwing looked into banishment practices and their impact on those affected by both the tribal and state criminal justice system. (laughs) 
more Alaskan Natives and American Indians are incarcerated in the state than any other minority. Alaska Native men alone make up nearly 40 percent of Alaska's prison population. But if some are issued a blue ticket or placed on parole, where can they actually go once they're released? David grew up in Tuksuk Bay, Alaska. It's a small village on an island along the Bering Sea coast in western Alaska. But he hasn't actually been there in a while. Hi. Nice to meet you. David is not his real name. He only agreed to talk to me in the first place if I didn't name him. I first met David last January inside a meeting room at the Anchorage Correctional Complex. The walls are cinder block, painted a bland vanilla color. We sit across from one another at a square metal table. He has dark brown eyes, high cheekbones, and a thin goatee. The many tattoos that cover his arms and chest peek out from behind his mustard yellow prison-issued scrubs. Well, just just this one over here, it's it's three skulls in my my shoulder with clouds. And these three, I don't know, it's like something that I don't really believe in, but it's all over, watching over my things on the grave. Behind it, it's um, the devil behind the graves, and Virgin, demonic Virgin Mary. David is in his early 30s. He served time in a maximum security prison, and as a teenager, he was in and out of juvenile detention. His record is extensive. There's domestic violence, vandalism, and theft. Last year, he said he was drunk and punched out a window. Can you tell me a little bit about the good parts of your childhood? I grew up with my siblings, my older brother. We, he taught us how to fish. He taught us how to fix nets. So he, just, he taught us what to survive or how to live off the land, how we go hunting for our family, do substance fishing, whatever. You know, other than that, we used to go to lap games and basketball. David likes to talk about home. English isn't his first language. He's Alaska Native, Yupik, and he grew up speaking the indigenous language in his community, Yuchtun. He speaks fondly of the place. We hunt together, we eat together, we play together, you know. Basically, the whole village helps each other. Like, every time we go out hunting, We'd share, our, we'd share our catch, you know, like certain families or old people, our elders. Mm-hmm. So elders always encourage us to be on the right path, stay out of trouble. Or, mm-hmm. you know. But David didn't always listen to his elders. He also remembers getting into trouble even as a little kid. It was back then, it was basically just like gummy balls. Like we always go to the stores and you know, and just be stupid about it. And it was like what? Like, Can you say that like, again? Uh, it's like bazooka balls or oh, yeah, yeah. We'd always go to stores and take them like without paying for them and later on get caught and get banned from the stores. And Tuksuk Bay's tribal council has banished David from the village. He physically assaulted his then-girlfriend more than once, drank heavily, and they say he was a danger to the community. A few days after I met David, he was released from prison. He flew from Anchorage 300 miles west to Bethel, the hub community closest to his village. But he didn't dare go any further. The Tuksuk Bay Tribal Council won't allow him in the village. That was back in January. In the spring, he went back to Anchorage, and then this past June, he was arrested again. He'd violated the conditions of his release. Yeah, because uh, they offered me three years flat on one, my 2019 20, case, and uh, they dropped the uh, attempted escape and just gave me a VCO, VCR. Okay. Days flat on. VCR means violating condition of release. I haven't been able to go back and visit David in person. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, there's no visitation at any of Alaska's prisons right now. Last winter, I went to Tuksuk Bay for a little over a week. While I was there, I went to church. The service was given by an elder, Joe Asuluk. He's also a Catholic deacon. (laughs) 
While I was visiting with Joe, he mentioned that years ago, he was also facing banishment. At the time, I didn't ask him much more about it. But this summer, I gave him a call. The phone connection was scratchy and distant. Hello? Yeah, talk to him. Oh, hi, Joe. How are you? It's Emily. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Joe doesn't speak English as well as he speaks his native language, Yuktun. So his distant cousin, Vanessa Lincoln, joined him to help translate. Oh, hold on, hold it. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, uh, Emily, yeah? As backup, I'm going to start recording right now. That sounds perfect. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Joe tells me he was in the Army in the early 1960s, based at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And while he was there, Joe says his baby sister passed away back in Alaska. But his family didn't tell him for more than four months. Little sister. Um, Baby sister. Um, his, yeah. Yeah, let me try it. Uh, what makes me start drinking was <clears throat> that maybe the drinking will help me to uh, forget about my little sister uh, or uh, to heal my uh, problem. I mean, what do what you call it? The grief. The grievance. It might be, uh, heal my yeah. grievance, but it didn't. And that was the mistake that I made. I started to drink in February the year of 1963. That was a bad start. That was a big mistake. Joe says he drank heavily for nearly two decades, and he says it would get him in trouble. Then, in 1981, Tuxuk Bay's tribal council called a meeting. They told Joe they were thinking about banishing him. Oh, the money, I, 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 yeah, I, I, um, he wasn't really scared. He was more worried and embarrassed about, um, you know, word getting out to the other villages and what he would have to tell them if he tried to move to those other villages. Um, and he, the first thing he said was, uh, um, he had children here, and his children knew Tuxuk Bay. And, you know, the, I think the thought of having them having to move away and not, not being here was his biggest worry. Had he been banished, he could have moved to two other villages on the same island. But he says he would have been too ashamed to explain why the tribal council made him leave. So Joe says he asked for a second chance. And then he sought guidance from his elders and two families in town. He, he said it wasn't hard for him because he had support. Um, just talking to him on how he... How... How how to live my life? Yeah. How 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 I should live my life? Yeah. How he should live his life? I told you good by To me, when uh, when late uh, late our chief Paulson told me that if you change your behavior in a good way. The people will want you, and maybe some days that the people will elect you, or some days uh, the pe- the community of Tuxuk Bay will start looking up to you. That 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 was a uh, uh, advice. Yeah, yeah. He just he said that better than I could have. I asked Joe about the differences between the Western criminal justice system and the tribal justice system. There's no state or federal law against village banishment in Alaska. In 2017, during a keynote speech, Alaska's attorney general at the time said the state 
doesn't generally interfere in tribal decisions like banishment because the method is considered a private civil action and tribes are sovereign governments. But the AG did say the state may help enforce banishment decisions by tribes due in part to limitations of available law enforcement in villages. He thinks those those people who do commit crime, um, if they were to be sent here to do community service and, uh, you know, stuff like that, that, that those things that are needed would be, uh, they'd be kept busy here. And they, you know, things like helping elders would be community service. Plus, at the same time, they'd have the elders to talk to them about, you know, like what um, his mentors did with him. So having access to to being in the village after getting out of jail would be effective because, because they'd have the resources that they need out here. Last year, a man accused of dealing drugs was banished from the northwest Arctic village of Kayana. He didn't need to be convicted for the tribe to decide on banishment. Since 2016, eight banishments have been reported by the state's largest newspaper and other local news outlets. And in the last three years, tribal leadership tells me two men, including David, have been banished from Tuxuk Bay. Banishment was uh, a method that was used uh, many years ago. This is Charles Moses. He's Tuxuk Bay's tribal court administrator. Our people had their own judicial system, and um, they had different procedures. It was uh, unwritten. There were no courts like the ones in Western culture. There was no jail, either. The Yupik system simply wasn't set up that way. So, for example, um, um, one of the very first things that was taught to me was this, Okay, today, when you play with your friends, play nicely with them. If they bother you, if they bully you, just leave them be. So that's something that that, that we grew up with. Once in a while, uh, something would happen... uh, But eventually, they'll come to realize that this person is not going to listen. So uh, the elders, I I call them the Council of Elders, get together and discuss this and say, we can't have this person uh, living with us. We'll just have to kick him out. And that, that was what happened. In, in, um, because we didn't have jails back then, um, that was a way of uh, of passing a sentence. The length of banishments, or whether they're reversed at all, are case by case and different for every tribe. There are 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska, and there are hundreds of small villages scattered across the state. Many are not road accessible. And most of these communities have never had any permanent or dependable law enforcement. It must take a lot, though. I mean, you'd probably have to do something pretty serious to get banished from your village, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, You would have to be destructive. Um, In our culture, harmony is our number one goal for community. Um, 
if if you disturb that harmony or or be like a thorn um, they'll tolerate that for as long as they can and then kick you out in your culture um family ties are extremely important yeah. too right so that breaks a family tie like mm-hmm. how do people deal with that in our in our culture the community the family is number one the individual is not Okay, the only time that uh, you hear that is at the schools. You'll see posters, I'm number one. That's what they teach. They they want you to think first of yourself. In our culture, it's not that way. And um, when everybody did what they were supposed to do, it made surviving easier. Tribal Administrator Robert Pitka is here too, listening. He says there's one thing he wants everyone to know. Banishment, it's rare. It doesn't happen very often. Some families may request it because of a family member causing sort of like chaos in the family, causing problems or arguments that sometimes comes when maybe the head of the house is wanting to ban this person just so they can have peace. But it doesn't come to that point yet in the tribal court or through the council. But banishment has happened because the person is violent. Robert and Charles say that the two men who've been banished from Tuxuk Bay recently have been asked to leave because of drug and alcohol use and extreme violence. Charles is in his 60s and Robert is in his 50s. The two grew up together and both acknowledge this system has its flaws. It doesn't matter where you go. If you don't have the education, if you don't have the skills, like uh, if you're not, uh, um, if you don't have any trait, then you're going to end up being homeless. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're still family. Don't just abandon them, abandon them. So how do you take care of somebody who has been banished? Like, how do you take Uh, care of them from a distance? Mainly what we try to do with, we we try to stay in touch with them. Okay, and sometimes that's not possible, Mm -hmm. especially when when they're homeless. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, We get news from them. And sometimes um, it's it's not forever. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how do you yeah. come back? Like, how do you unbanish yourself? Well, basically, what happens is um, uh, the person who was banished will will get a hold of um, their family and 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 talk to them, and uh, if they're able to convince them. Then that, then that family goes to the uh, council and, and, and tells them that uh, they want their son or their daughter back for a trial. Oh, and then it's just a trial period? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it wouldn't be yes, no, but we would want to see an improvement from him, like in writing. We want to hear, or in writing, from him who was banned that he wants to contribute into the community, be part of the community with a changed behavior or no more violence, and then council would decide from there. While many villages don't have a police force, Alaska does have a program that installs village public safety officers in some places. VPSOs do everything from search and rescue to firefighting and including law enforcement. Today, there are 38 VPSOs statewide. Less than a decade ago, there were more than twice as many VPSOs. Jody Potts used to be one of them. When someone is released from 
jail or prison and they're placed on supervised probation or parole. I often would get calls from a probation or parole officer saying, hey, um, so-and-so is just released from prison. They want to return to home to their village. Do you have a VPSO there that can supervise them? And I'm like, nope, I don't. So then that person cannot return home. When someone is banished, it's usually a last resort. Often they have a prior criminal record and are already fighting charges in Alaska's court system. They probably have to make court appearances in a hub community like Fairbanks or Bethel or Anchorage. Many people are out on parole and if they haven't been banished by their tribe, Potts says Alaska's Western system effectively banishes people from their villages regardless. She grew up in the Alaska native village of Eagle, not too far from the Canadian border. She was a VPSO for a decade. You know, I mean, I have a, a cousin that just really struggled his whole life, you know, had a lot of trauma growing up. And, you know, he um, spent a lot of time in jail throughout his adult life. And anytime he got out and he was really gung-ho to do good, of course, they want to go home. Like, they're best at home, you know, with their family and their people and, you know, their culture and living on the land and doing things. You know, that's the healthiest place for them, but they can't return home. And so, you know, my cousin was always stuck here in Fairbanks, you know, being a felon. He couldn't get a job and, you know, he didn't have, you know, experience. So it was just a real big struggle. And he was just homeless on the streets until he, you know, went to jail the next time. And it was just this vicious cycle. You know, he's always breaking parole because uh, he just didn't have any any support, any way to get out of that system. So you're just kind of stuck in the system and the cycle. And, you know, it's really unfortunate to see that. And that's very common for... What happened to your cousin? He passed away a year oh, ago. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. He's like a brother to me, really close. I mean, yeah, he had all these, you know, problems in his life, but he was the funniest guy I ever knew. Super talented artist. Um, you know, my kids just loved him. And even though he's basically, you know, in a uh, career criminal, I guess you could say. But he was a good guy. And, yeah, so, um, yeah, sadly, he was just kind of floating here and there um, on probate, on parole. And Did he grow up in Eagle Village, too? Yeah. But he couldn't go home because mm-hmm. he was on parole. Yeah. I met with Jody at a really busy time this summer. She'd just returned from a big fishing trip with her family up on the Yukon River. It was late August. As her parakeets sang in the dining room, she was cleaning giant glass jars at her kitchen sink. A cooler filled with freshly caught salmon sat nearby on the linoleum floor. Yeah, so <clears throat> summertime, we're just like so busy, like just getting preparing for winter, you know. And even, um, like, I don't really have time for much else, but, you know, um, you know, we're at fish camp, which is the place where we go to harvest salmon, and it's our traditional food source, and, you know, our traditional foods is our medicine, you know, and so we're going to be, uh, jarring up some of our smoked salmon today, and then, um, Summer, we'll also be picking berries. We've gotten a few gallons of blueberries from the land. And so, you know, all that is just really important to our way of life. Mm -hmm. It's really important to our health and wellness to be able to maintain this traditional way of life. I ask Jody if she thinks things could have been different for her cousin. If the state system had allowed him to return to Eagle, where he could eat traditional foods and reconnect with his language and family, might he have been able to rehabilitate himself? It's hard to say. I mean, you know, he had a real serious problem with addiction, you know. And so um, he's always happier there, you know. But times he's also been there, he struggled, you know. And so it was, yeah, it was hard. I'm asking because earlier you said, you know, our traditional foods are our medicine. Yeah. Um, And, you know, a lot of indigenous people tell me, like, our our culture is our medicine. Yep. Um, And so if you're not able to go back to where you came from and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wonder, like, 
if that also sort of causes problems for people and their inability to rehabilitate themselves, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It's um, for Native people, um, you know, our way of life, culture, family, our community is our greatest strength and, you know, can really support resiliency and recovery, you know? Do you think that there are ways to incorporate uh, Alaskan Native culture into the criminal justice system so that you know, people who have behaved badly enough to be banished from their communities um, get the medicine, mm-hmm. as you describe it, that they need. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's so many ways that they could, um, you know, include uh, Native culture in, in rehabilitation. Like how? Um, boy, uh, ceremony, drumming, singing, traditional foods. I mean, um, you know, and also counseling with an, a Native healer. You know, and, you know, really what we're seeing um, with the rates of incarceration of Native people and the crime rates in villages and stuff is really a symptom of historical trauma. And so I think a lot of the folks that um, I arrested just don't even understand why they're struggling, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think having, um, you know, Native counselors and um, culture uh, available to people in the uh, criminal justice system would be a huge benefit in healing. A few weeks later, Jody told me in a message that she believes at the very least Alaska Natives who are in prison should be allowed to smudge. Smudging is a spiritual cleansing practice where sage, cedar, or sweetgrass are burned. Jody also says she believes people in prison should have improved access to informed counselors who are trained in Alaska Native cultural practices. Hey, Emily. Early one morning in June, I got a phone call. I didn't recognize the phone number, so I didn't answer. He's been trying to get a hold of you, but um, if you want to get a hold of him, call back on this number. He'll be with you. But, uh, yeah. Have a wonderful day and call back late. Whoever made this call told me David wanted to talk to me. I suspect this was actually David calling, but I never got a chance to ask him about it. Later that day, from what I can tell in the court records, he resisted arrest and was found in possession of a controlled substance. He was arraigned the following afternoon. Since I've known David, he's had at least two phone numbers. His Facebook page went dark for a while this spring because he couldn't afford a data plan. Last winter, he called because he didn't have enough money for food. Another time, he called me because he couldn't pay an electricity bill. I couldn't help him, and beyond suggesting a local charity and warming shelter or the state public assistance office, I just didn't know what to tell him. Do you call your family... Ever? Do you have friends that check on you? Yeah, I call my family. I've been calling my brother and my moms and a couple of my friends out there. I don't actually know who David talks with. I called his mom once, and during that call, she told me she had nothing to say about him. His brother also declined to talk about him. This is exactly the scenario Charles Moses predicted, and Jody Potts has seen play out in her family, and on the job. This is the part of banishment and the Western parole system that's not working for Alaska Natives. This fall, David agreed to that plea deal that would put him in prison for three years. He was transferred to a medium security facility in Wasilla. So I wanted to ask you if you think... um if you think that, you know, three years and three months in prison is a good thing for you? Uh, well, it depends, depends on what's recommended to the courts. Yeah, but what do you, I mean, but what do you think? I mean, what do, what do you think about if you have to spend another three years behind bars? To be honest, I don't know. Um, it's from the way the prison system is run. Uh, I have no comment on it. 
David doesn't want to tell me about his experience because he's worried anything he says could come back on him while he's there in prison. He doesn't trust the system. And because of the coronavirus, no one can visit him. And his only lifeline right now is the postal system, but even his mail is reviewed before he receives it. During one of our phone calls, David perked up when I mentioned I spoke with Joa Suluk, one of his elders back home in Tuxuk Bay. But he hasn't spoken with Joe about his situation. And even if Joe could offer him some advice and support, it's probably unlikely that he'd be able to receive it in prison right now. Emily Schwing reported this story from Alaska. Thank you for listening. For more information, toolkits, and to download the annotated transcript for this episode, visit 70millionpod.com. 70 Million is an open source podcast because we believe we are all part of the solution. We encourage you to use our episodes and supporting materials in your classrooms, organizations, and anywhere they can make an impact. You may rebroadcast parts of or entire episodes of our three seasons without permission. Just please drop us a line so we can keep track. 70 Million is made possible by a grant from the Safety and Justice Challenge at the MacArthur Foundation. 70 Million is a production of Lantigua Williams & Co. Season 3 was edited by Phyllis Fletcher and Laura Flynn. Cedric Wilson is our lead producer and sound designer. Virginia Laura is our managing producer. Leslie Datsitz is our marketing lead. Laura Tillman is our staff writer, and Michelle Baker is our photo editor. Sarah McClure is our lead fact checker. Ryan Katz also contributed fact checking. Emma Forbes is our production assistant. Juleka Lantigua Williams is the creator and executive producer. I'm Mitzi Miller. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.